Welcome to the City Club of Eugene's September 29, 2017 program, Eight Crimes in Eugene, Impact and Response. Our speakers today are Jennifer Lawrence, Vander Higgins, Ibrahim Hamid, Ruben Bundy, and Nadia Jose. This is our fourth program in our 2017-2018 program. Are you a mic or a line level? I'm Sandra Higgins, City Club President. The, club, the City Club brings together civic-minded people to make Eugene a better place to live, work, and play. We are all members in a community and we're members here of a nonprofit. So our members and our sponsors are who keep the City Club going. So become a member of City Club at cityclubofeg.org. Support for City Club is provided exclusively by our members and our sponsors, including Evans, Elder and Brown, and Subert, Commercial Real Estate, Jerry Bucas, Landscape Architect, Luvas Cobb, Attorneys, and one of our Sapphire sponsors, George Rohde Repair Shop. Supporting the City Club comes from George Rohde through his auto repair shop, providing car care with a conscience. They have three locations in Eugene. And thanks to University of Oregon, Academic Extension, and also to KLCC, City Club, broad, City Club programs are broadcast on KLCC Public Radio 89.7 at 6.30 on Monday following the program. The coordinators of today's program are Joel Corrin and John Belcher, and I'd like to thank both of them for organizing this important program. And with that, I'd like to have Joel do our introduction. Thank you. In Richmond, there were Nazi flag and KKK. Uh, in Eugene, there have been flocks around the Whitaker neighborhood and in North Eugene High School. There were incidents at the Islamic Center. Uh, Hispanic and Mexican kids are being told to go back where you came from. There are hate crimes and they're in this country, and there are hate crimes being committed in Eugene. There is the perception by many that these incidents are on the rise. And in today's program, we hope to present to you some of the statistics from around Eugene and the impact that it has on the communities being discriminated against and two different ways of dealing with hate crimes. You have a description of the bios of the speakers in your program, and I'd ask you to read that. But our speakers today are uh, Jennifer Yeras van der Hagen from the manager of the uh, Human Rights and Neighborhood Involvement Office. And if you think that your public employees are not out working hard for you, Jennifer was speaking to the Local Government Action Committee of the Chamber of Commerce at 7.30 this morning on the outreach that the city is doing with um, in dealing with the community in hiring the new police chief. Ibrahim Hamid is one of the most well-respected people in Eugene. He's been a fighter for peace and justice and understanding among all the communities in Eugene, and he makes the best state by him anywhere. <laughs> Ruben Bundy is uh, new to the area from Dallas, Texas. He's involved with the Lane County Defense Network, and he will discuss his group's methods of dealing with hate incidents. And my friend, Nadia Telsey, has been an anti-violence activist and a peace activist for years, and she has presented seminars on how to deal with incidents of hate, and you will have the opportunity to sign up with, for one later today. So 
Uh, without further ado, I ask you to read the bios of, of these excellent speakers, and I'll call on Jay to come up and uh, give the perspective and the numbers. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with, here with you. Uh, my name is Jennifer Yannis Vandernagen, and I manage the Human Rights and Neighborhood Involvement Office. And a part of our work is in partnering with the Eugene Police Department to ensure that we have um, the ability to both track, monitor, and respond to hate crimes as they arise here in the area. Um, we also support our neighborhood associations and the Human Rights Commission, uh, and generally support the organization and advancing the work around human rights and equity. Today I'm going to share with you both how we track hate and bias crimes and incidents and also talk to you about the numbers that we've seen in 2016 and to date in 2017. Human rights and neighborhood involvement dedicates staff and resources to track and address incidents of hate and bias in an effort to paint a fuller picture of what's happening in our community. Uh, the types of work that we do include tracking, community education and outreach, and developing strong community partnerships. And these are among some of the most important ways we know to help address hate and bias activity happening in our area. In accordance with the City of Eugene's Hate and Bias Incident Response Plan, that our office provides victim and community support of both hate crimes and non-criminal incidents. And I just want to take a second to explain what the difference might be. So a hate crime is something that would otherwise be categorized by the police as a crime and was motivated because of hate or bias. So the person uh, has done it for that reason. And a, a hate incident is something that doesn't necessarily rise to the level of a crime, something that EPD uh, would necessarily investigate uh, because it's non-criminal in nature, but it is something that people experience. And uh, an example of that might be uh, a young person walking down the street who gets called a racial slur by a total stranger, uh, and those two folks never meet again, necessarily. They might, it could raise to a different level, but. Um, that's the kind of incident that we're tracking as non-criminal incidents. Um, and that's important because the 2016 report and the reports that we've created to date track both of those for a reason. And that's because we believe that the underlying current of what's happening, the things that are not criminal, are what's bubbling below the surface as we, um, and, and it, what people are testing to see if hate and bias activity will be accepted in our community. So we think it's important that we track both and also that we respond to both to make sure that folks know that hate and bias isn't welcome here. The reports come in in a variety of ways. Uh, folks can report online, call our office, or stop by. If somebody's not sure if their incident is a hate crime or a bias or hate incident, uh, we'd love for them to call the Human Rights and Neighborhood Involvement Office directly, and we'll help people figure out if it's something that should be reported to the police or not. Um, and are happy to talk them through that. The reports that we uh, receive represent only a small fraction of what's happening in our community. So it's estimated that across the country, only about 25 to 42% of all hate and bias crimes are reported to law enforcement. So that means that's a very small percentage. Uh, we hope that by releasing this report, doing community education on events and also partnering with local organizations that will be able to increase those numbers of what's reported because people will hopefully understand how to report them and feel comfortable in reporting them. And uh, so here are some of the details for the 2016 report. In 2016, there were 82 total hate and bias crimes and non-criminal incidents. By comparison, in 2015, there were 59. 2014, there were 69, and 2013, there were 55. Race is and has been the lead motivating factor in reported crimes. 42%, um, I'm sorry, that makes up 54% of all hate crimes and 42% of all non-criminal incidents that were reported to us were motivated by race. Crimes reported based on um, Race particularly impacts the African-American community. 
African American community members disproportionately uh, are targeted by hate and bias activity with 36% of all hate crimes being committed against them. In 2016, there were 10 incidents involving physical violence. Uh, by comparison, there were 17 in 2015. Physical violence was experienced mostly by people of color and LGBTQ community members. Hate and bias activity, as with years past, occurs in every corner of our community. It's happening in our schools, and we work closely with school resource officers to understand what's going on in schools and to respond to incidents as they occur. Um, the majority of activity happening in schools is graffiti uh, related, at least as, uh, as it relates to crimes. And most incidents, uh, there were incidents in ev almost every single neighborhood, but primarily we're seeing the highest concentration in the downtown area and in the West University neighborhood. Uh, we really do urge folks to take a, an opportunity to report hate and bias activity. And uh, we think that we, there's been a pretty significant increase between 2016 and 2017. Uh, so, by comparison to date, we've had 57 hate crimes reported to the Eugene Police Department. Last year, total, we had 44. So that's a pretty dramatic increase, and we think that's happening for a number of reasons, but we know that our community is not unique across the country. Uh, communities just like ours, bigger and smaller, are seeing increases in hate and violence activity. Um, so the. So by comparison, what I wanted to share with you is that um, at this time, in 2016, there had been 26 hate and bias crimes. And at this point, um, 18 of the hate and bias crimes are related to race, and 11 are related to, to religion. And one of the big increases we've seen is anti-Semitic graffiti across our community. And so those numbers are reflected in some part there, uh, but that's just the tip of the iceberg of the number of uh, swastikas and anti-Semitic graffiti that's gone up across our area. Uh, so uh, we look forward to continuing to work with community partners and different organizations and hope to increase uh, the mechanisms for folks to report. Uh, you can find a copy of the report at the City Club's website in the coming days if you're interested in taking a look at it yourself, and you can find it on the City of Eugene's website as well. Um, and you can uh, report hate and bias incidents and crimes by um, coming to the Human Rights and Neighborhood Involvement Office in the Atrium Building in downtown, or Suite 116. You can call 541-682-5177. Go online and submit a form uh, by the internet. So we really want to create as many ways as possible for people to be able to report these incidents. And of course, if you're experiencing immediate danger, we hope that folks will call 911 uh, and, and to uh, have help from the police department. Thank you very much. atrocities in New York and D.C., I was invited by city officials, police, and mayor to a press conference at the Cuthbert Theater. Um, and at that uh, conference, I uh, expressed my sympathies and my heartfelt support for the families of the murdered folks in those cities. And I also denounced in no uncertain way, in clear and strong voice, those murderers. I also disavowed any relationship to them, meaning they are not Muslims. I'm a Muslim. I don't kill anybody. I don't appreciate violence in any form or shape. So I was sure to denounce that clearly. On that same day, a family in Eugene got 
uh, phone call threatening their their lives. Uh, fortunately, there was a caller ID involved, and the police was able to track uh, the one that made that phone call. Soon after that, hate crimes against Arabs, Muslims, and those that look like them rose by 1,600%. Not long after that, bricks were thrown through my glass window at the restaurant on two separate occasions, one of which narrowly missed a lady who was celebrating her birthday. And those bricks were thrown from vehicles that were traveling at pretty good velocity down 13th Avenue, so they could cause some damage. So I also on a Thursday night, had a young man walk into my dining room and throw a smoke bomb, instantly, instantly clearing the whole dining room of patrons. Um, those were some of my personal experiences with hate crimes soon after 2001. And also I remember when the synagogue, the local synagogue was shut up and vandalized. And I remember the community response of having a candle vigil um, to support uh, the uh, synagogue and the Jewish community. Um, I had been here, living here 48 years, and I really wasn't aware of hate crimes or groups of hate. But I became more aware of them, and I became also aware of the different shapes and forms that hate crimes can take, and the different groups in town that are targeted. Um, blacks, obviously, whether they're African Americans or blacks from other world countries, Hispanics, Jews, um, LGBTQ, the homeless community also gets targeted. So um, I may focus a little bit more on the hate crimes towards Muslims because I have a little bit more insight in that, to that community. But I am in full-hearted support of all those communities that are targeted. Hate crimes, as you will, affect communities in many, many different ways. You know, they range from um, the loss of life to loss of dignity. Um, Jennifer talked about uh, hate crimes that are, don't ri rise up to the level of a crime, but yet they're intimidation, harassment. An African American is shopping, and yet the security person is following every step of their way. That's a microaggression that they feel. It is not a crime, but nonetheless, it is robbing them of their dignity as a human being. Um, it also puts a community at a, a fear, a level of fear. They, they feel afraid for their existence. They want to fly under their radar. They don't want to participate in communal events. Kids at schools, they're told, as Joel said, pack your bags, especially in the recent atmosphere. Pack your bags. You're being deported soon. They're harassed. Women and families, as they come out of a shopping mall, they find their tires slashed. They look around to see if any other car's tires were slashed. Nope, they're not. It's just theirs. They look at each other and they go, ah, oh, because we're wearing the hijab. So, um, Two men also, as we are called, lost their lives up in Portland as they, de they were defending two young Muslim women from being harassed at the AMX train. And one was wounded. And the list just goes on and on. What do we do about this? 
Well, it's great if we can support our local human rights commission. It's great if we uh, can um, lobby our legislator, legislators for more powerful legislations to protect those marginalized communities. Yet, combating hate crime cannot be left to the government. It is the job of all of us, all of us. We can't find answers out there. They have to be looked at in here. Most of the answers, usually the ones that we find out there, they address the symptoms. They really don't address the causes. So the answers that matter are the ones that have to be found in our collective consciousness, in our collective hearts. We cannot assume disability as say it's somebody else's problem. I'm not a marginalized community. It's their issues. Only, it is only when each one of us looks deeply inside of their consciousness, into her and his self, that we can find answers that start making sense to us. I hope that we all start looking.
we have somebody else to come out. Always trust the millennium. They know how to do this is Rachel. This is our PR person. She helps those of us who are not very tech savvy to become more tech savvy. As you can see, she is really, really good at what she does. This is what hate group activity in the U.S. looks like as of right now. SPLC is currently tracking 917 hate groups in the United States. They've noted that since the election, that number has gone up roughly 25% to create these current numbers. They're only currently tracking 11 hate groups in the entire state of Oregon. And if you look really closely at Oregon, you'll notice that Portland, Bend, and Rosewood, but Roseburg, I'm sorry, I'm from Texas, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll notice that Eugene is not on there. They have no information about us. That's not their fault. It's the fault, frankly, of organizations like mine who have been taking things down and not doing the best job of reporting with other groups, which is something we're working on. Um, and we will make this available to the City Club website for everybody that's listening on the radio today, so you will be able to like go in and click on this. We sort of break it down into two different categories. The first category is the idea of white nationalism. Um, it should be pointed out that white nationalism and the idea of white nationalism is actually like rebranding. This is good old fashioned Nazism. Like the, like the white, the alt-right, they began moving away from like traditional symbols of Nazism, the swastika and things like that, and started moving towards this idea of the alt-right. And one of the ways that they did it was is they started talking about white nationalism. White nationalism being a political ideology that believes that the United States is a white homeland, and they want to be separate from people of color and everybody that they don't view as white, which includes LGBTQ people. Um, so Vanguard America was founded. It's one of the groups that we're tracking here. These pictures are pictures, pictures that we have taken down in the university area. You'll notice that it has, we have the right to exist with a pretty standard like 50s style like white family. Um, up in the upper left corner, or upper right corner, excuse me, you'll see that we have fascism, the only, the, the next step for America. And that hatchet there that's under the man is actually the old Italian fascist symbol. Down in the bottom we have Protect White Families, also from Vanguard America. And then this is their logo. A pretty standard American Eagle holding the Italian fascist hatchet. They were started by Dylan Isaray. Dylan Isaray is a former Marine and a like military veteran. Um, they, we began like noticing their stuff going up in May. They went from the very cheap homemade um, stickers to the much more expensive, like well-printed posters and stickers. Um, Identity Europa was founded by Nathan D'Amigo, also a Marine veteran. In 2007, they began organizing in Eugene in April. Um, they are particularly concerning to us right now because we started off with some very like cheap stickers and now we have very expensive like photo paper quality like posters and flyers not only for Identity Europe itself as you can see in the bottom corner but also for their publishing wing Arctos. Arctos publishes books by a man like mostly by a man named Guillaume Faye. Guillaume Faye is a very famous French racial realist. Racial realism is a call up to the old race science. Okay. 
like terrorism. We have three groups that we know are organizing. American Front is the most well known. American Front is was it's homegrown. It was actually started in Portland in the nineties. Jake Glasky went to prison from here for throwing bricks with swastikas on it through synagogue windows. He got out last year. He immediately started reorganizing the group. We are currently tracking several members of that group, organizing both here, their home bases in Crespo. Um, you have National Socialist Movement. This is a group trying to tie everybody together, so all of these disparate groups coming together under one banner. Um, and then finally, Operation Werewolf, which takes its name from a actual Nazi um, terrorist group from World War II. So um, from there, yeah, that gives you kind of a picture of what's going on in this in this city. Like we definitely have not just a hate crime problem, but it's a hate crime problem coming from very specific organizations. There's a list of groups that are fighting back on it, and. Um, this is our information. Uh, we would ask that you get in contact with us if you want to help out. We have plenty of places to put people, like not just taking down graffiti and things like that, but PR and community relations and whatnot. Thank you very much. Also, we have a GoFundMe on our Facebook page if you want to donate. So we've heard about acts of hate, both individual acts of hate, and then these more organized acts of hate. These acts are symptoms of deep, a deep and long-standing infection. And this infection feeds on silence and passivity, which come across as approval or, at best, indifference. It's up to all of us to deny it its sustenance and add care and love to our community. I'm here to talk about one small effort to address this hate, and that is learning how to step up when you see something happening and someone being harassed. This is known as bystander slash upstander intervention. I want to make it clear this is just one small piece of the responses that we need to take. It doesn't address the underlying causes of the hate. It doesn't address the many times when our neighbors and some of us are harassed or threatened and there's no bystander there. And it doesn't address the many times when there's no targeted person there. When we hear someone saying something bigoted or ignorant, and unfortunately, all too often, they're met with silence. And remember, that comes across as approval or indifference. We need to learn how to break that silence. I want to tell you a story. Um, this is just one typical hate story. It's it, in the trainings we use scenarios that we um, apply principles to and then role play. A woman contacted me. She uh, was a woman of color. She was in a Starbucks waiting for a meeting. And while she was waiting, she was Skyping on her computer with a friend who was deaf and they were Skyping using American Sign Language. And she said she was used to people kind of looking at her when she was doing this, but in this case, there was a man actually glaring at her. And then he got, came over to her, stuck his face within inches of her face, and yelled, this is white America now. Take your retarded self and go somewhere else. Trump is our president now. So you can imagine, not only was she humiliated, she was pretty terrified. But what made the whole thing worse was that there were other customers there, there were employees there, but nobody said anything. So why is this? I don't believe that everyone agreed with him. I don't. When we ask people, why are you silent? And I've had to have this conversation with myself. There are two main reasons that come up. One is that people are afraid. And that's certainly legitimate. Two people died in Portland. Um, but there are plenty of times when the threat is not that great. And sometimes we're afraid of disapproval or hurting someone's feelings. And in those cases, we need to develop some courage muscle. Um, the other reason that people don't say anything or do anything is they don't know what to do. So these trainings are 
designed to address both these issues. And what we do in the trainings is we go over uh, a range of responses to hate incidents, um, and always with an idea of safety for everybody in mind. And there's no guarantees about that, but that's what we're aiming for. Each person makes their own decisions about which of those kinds of responses they feel comfortable making. Every situation is different. Every one of us is different. We have different experiences, different identities, different skills, different sizes, different physical abilities, and so on and so on. What's most important is we do not shame or blame. The shame and blame rests with the people who are putting the hate out, not with those who are trying to respond. Um, there are some principles that underlie what we do. One of them is we want to de-escalate the violence. Often when people hear about intervention, the first thing they think about is confronting the perpetrator. And that's actually not what we teach. We want to de-escalate the violence and we don't want to add to it. So no finger pointing, no screaming at somebody, no accusing them of things. Keeping in mind there's a difference between someone's behavior and their identity. And addressing the identity is a sure way to escalate things. Second, the second principle underlying what we do is that the focus needs to go on the person or people being targeted, not on ourselves. So I know that when I'm in a situation like that Starbucks, my very first impulse is to want to get in the face of the harasser because I am outraged, I am upset, and that's all about me. And this is not all about us. This is about all about what is the person who's being targeted need at that moment. So uh, there are a number of different strategies, and I'm going to go very quickly through them. One of them is being an active bystander, getting a description of somebody, taking a photo or a film if that's safe. Um, in that Starbucks case, going to get the manager, um, calling for help in some way. Being a clear ally to the person or people being targeted, in that case going to sit with a woman, interrupting the guy by starting a random conversation like, wow, I haven't seen you in so long, blah, 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 blah. Finding out what they need. Do they want you to sit with them? Do they want you to, to leave with them? Do they want you to call a friend for them? But in all cases, validating for them that that was totally not okay, um, what happened to them. Distracting the perpetrator to break the momentum of what's going on. Involving other people, employees, other customers in that case. And finally, going back afterwards. So a woman shared with me at one of our trainings that she, this was in Eugene, she had been waiting to get her blood drawn and she overheard a phlebotomist berating a Latina woman um, in a horrible way. She didn't know what to do and she did nothing at the time, which was very hard for her. But what she did do is she <coughs> went back later, talked to the clinic manager, and that resulted in trainings for the staff and some protocol in that office. We have a better chance of doing something if we've trained, if we've thought it through, um, if we've come up with words that we might use. So I hope that some of you get involved in these trainings. They right now are happening once a month, though we have more people getting ready to teach, so we're hoping there'll be more of them. They are two to three hours each. And Judy Bowles, who's sitting there, has a sign up for uh, if you're interested in a training. And at this point, I want to thank Judy and other members of Temple Beth Israel's the Sanctuary Temple Beth Israel who have put in many, many hours to make sure that these trainings happen by doing all the logistics. For people on the radio, the way to get a hold of us is SURGE, which stands up for showing up for racial justice. It's surj-info at googlegroups.com. surj-info at googlegroups.com. I would hope that some of you will consider this as one response that you might want to take. If we want to counter the hate, silence is not an option. However, we choose to break it. Thank you. Mike Thank Rose, you. City Club member. Aware of hate crime in Eugene, I've lived here over 50 years, and I'm certainly aware it exists. And during that time, I have developed 
my own concept of who are the perpetrators. Do you have any demographics that would clarify who they really are? Do we need to have the question repeated? Or? Okay, great, go ahead. Uh, so, Jen, City of Eugene, and I would say that it really ranges. Oftentimes we have people, um, actually oftentimes as far as non-criminal incidents, what we find is that the perpetrators are kind of fleeting in a moment, so they send, tend to be um, leaving the scene rather quickly. And so we don't always have a perfect description of who they are, and people don't seem to be aware of that individual in their lives. Um, one thing I would say is that it seems by and large that these incidents are not just happening by motivation of one community, but many members of our community are perpetrating these incidents and crimes. Uh, Ruben Bundy, uh, Land Community Defense Network. Uh, for us, I mean, it depends on which groups we're talking about, right? Like there's a certain element of this that very much does come from, there, there's a whole element of this that is literally prison gangs like white supremacist prison gangs, right? And then you have a whole element of this that's like, you know, older white men who are involved in the Ku Klux Klan and older organizations that have been around a lot longer and much more established. For things like this new white identity movement, this is mostly, you know, college age or recent college graduate males, you know, like who have been, and a lot of them are internet friendly, they're very tech savvy and things like that. So it, it like it kind of depends on like who you're ta like which group you're looking at at any given time because they all kind of have their own like sort of demographics if that makes sense. Mariah Learn, Al Nekbo Awareness Project. I'm a Palestinian human rights activist and have been repeatedly harassed, spit upon, insulted threatened with violence, and physically attacked. I have been followed and narrowly dodged accidents with deliberately belligerent and intimidating drivers. Our information and display materials have been stolen, thrown about, damaged, defaced, and treated with contempt by hateful Israel partisans, compounded by our so-called peace community's indifference. Okay. Why is Jewish supremacists supremacism not confronted by our community like any other hateful and discriminatory racism. Had this been done to a person of color or any other minority population member, what do you think would have been the likely community response? Did you understand the question or need a clarification? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, I will answer broadly because uh, what I can say is that had there been any incident that was criminal in nature, it would have been reported and taken as a hate crime through the Eugene Police Department, and that's true based on any political affiliation. And so that would fall into our hate and bias reporting every year. Um, the other thing I'll say is that community organizations and our office uh, partner with folks who experience incidents like that that are non-criminal and would be happy to work with you to address any of those issues and come up with a proper community response as it relates to a hate or bias incident. Thank you. Next question, please. Yeah, I'm Jack Dresser. Uh, you know, it brought up uh, Islamophobia and asked what we can do about it, about racism generally. And he stressed the importance of uh, collective consciousness. Well, you know, collective consciousness is very heavily influenced by propaganda. And so regarding Islamophobia, I'm wondering why activists don't identify and expose the well-organized coordinated network of Islamophobic propaganda organizations funded by right-wing foundations with a lot of money that provide anonymity for donors and which explicitly focus on promoting Israel and attacking its critics. Eve, do you want to take that? Okay. Um, so, 
from our perspective at LCDM, right? Like, Islamophobia operates. Sorry, I think I'm standing too close to that. It operates much in the same way that anti-Semitism did in the 30s in Germany, right? It's and especially with the groups that we track and follow, right? It's this sort of gateway into all of this other hateful material and hateful stuff, right? Currently, from our perspective and from the groups that we organize with, the two go hand in hand. You're at one one in the same time and anti-Semite and an Islamophobe, right? So, like, it's, for us at least, it's, it's hard to, like, take that all the way through in terms of advocacy and things like that because we are very much a organization that works with vulnerable communities in the community. Does, does that make sense? Well, I'm not sure I have answers, but I know that the Muslim population in the world is larger than that of China and the U.S. put together probably a surprise to a bunch of you. Uh, yet, 62% of Americans have never met a Muslim. Okay, 65% of them though, disapprove of Muslims. <laughs> okay, now if there is n not something wrong with that picture, I don't know what is. <laughs> Uh, my name is Michael Kerrigan with Committee Alliance of Lane County. Uh, we are a, a member group of, of City Club. Uh, recently, uh, Cal got a phone call from uh, uh, John Belcher of the R River Road Community Org Organization asking us to help respond to a swastika that was painted on the, uh, the front door of, the, uh, of North Eugene H High School. So we went in, into the, the neighborhood and knocked on doors and told uh, folks what happened, gave them uh, contact uh, in, in info so they contact the, the, the city if it happened in the future. But what are some of the uh, other things that each of us can do in our own neighbor, neighborhoods to, to, to challenge hate? This is Nadia Telsey. I think if there are things that happen in the neighborhoods, the first thing to do is organize the neighborhood. The more that we know our neighbors, the more that if somebody is harassed in the neighborhood and other people put up signs supporting those neighbors, um, showing solidarity or identifying with the same group, if neighbors get together to educate themselves about the hate, the racism, the Islamophobia, the anti-Semitism, the homophobia, etc., then that will inoculate neighborhoods and prepare them to respond. Yeah, I would like to also uh, just remind folks that it does take all of us. So none of us is absolved of responsibility. I know that we, especially Americans after the elections, we're keeping our one eye at least on uh, Americans uh, that especially Muslim origin who may be getting radicalized by ISIS and other groups I suggest that we should keep the other eye on our own kids from getting radicalized by those hate mongers here homegrown hate mongers so we have about total eight minutes left for questions and answers so go for it this is Mary Layton a City Club member since 2006 and I'm asking a question from a guest are hate groups exercising their right to free speech? So this is, this is actually an argument that we do a lot. Um, there's sort of two ways to go about it. Like the, the rough answer is yes, right? But the Supreme Court has also roundly upheld the idea of fighting words. The, up until RAV versus um, Minneapolis, like racial slurs were included in that. And then that prohibition went away. But it's important to remember that even then, the Supreme Court didn't strike down the idea that racial slurs were, in fact, fighting words. What they said was is that the statute involved was too narrowly tailored to actually like encompass other forms of speech. So it was a problem with the statute, not a problem with the idea of fighting words. That's sort of the legal answer. The societal answer is, is that there has yet to be an incident 
of these free speech rallies and the like that hasn't been precipitated by violence. A anti-fascist monitoring network known as uh, It's Going Down recently just published a report pointing out that even at the failed free speech rally in Berkeley, Free Speech Week, it was preceded and followed up by an uptick in racial violence, anti-LGBTQ violence, and the like. We have Jeremy Christian on our own trains here in Oregon who is yelling free speech at his trial after he stabbed two people to death and trying to liken the two things together. The problem isn't their free speech and their right to free speech. The problem is the violence that goes along with it. These groups have proven over and over and over and over and over again that violence is the method and that in fact what they are doing is trying to precipitate a fight. And then when the fight comes, they try to hide behind the First Amendment, but the First Amendment doesn't really even give them any grounds. Thank you. Uh, Sandy Erickson, City Club member. For over 200 years, this country has been dominated by men, and specifically in this country, white men. And given uh, Ruben's uh, demographics that this is perpetuated by men, uh, my question is, is there anything or any group or effort out there that actually identifies the culture of hypermasculinity and seeks to target that culture for, you know, better understanding? <laughs> Who wants to answer that one, a man or a woman? So, <laughs> sorry, I feel like I'm talking way too much. Like, the interesting thing about the quote-unquote alt-right movement is, is that for the first time you saw together, come together a whole host of despicable aspects, right? Like you had anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, like normal racism, and then you had emerge what's called the men's rights movement. Right? And the men's rights movement was very much just pro-rape. Like they were pushing for uh, statutes that made rape in a public place like legal in order to quote, teach women a lesson. This has been long, this has been long tracked. Also, like there are several groups here that do track this stuff. Uh, men's Center on campus does a lot of work with this. It's Going Down is a good resource. They just recently published a whole report tracing the history of toxic masculinity from the Klan all the way through to the modern like alt-right movement. So yeah, there are some resources out there and it is tracked. Also being tracked is the way at which these groups are starting to like um, recruit women you know, because for the longest time their, their sort of model was is that women were there to provide white babies for the revolution and as it turns out that's failing so they're, they're moving into like a new, a, a new way of doing it and what you're finding now are a lot, uh, a lot more women being organized into the street fighter teams and things like that that these groups manifest. So we, we really are going to run out of time for questions. Oh, um, if you have something well, very quickly, I just want to say that one targeted group that's left out a lot is women who have endured this kind of harassment for decades. But the other piece of this also is that of the stories that I hear, an alarming number of the harassment, uh, uh, harassment is committed by women. Thank you. We have about three minutes for the last two questions. Thanks. I'm Raisa Maddox, uh, representing Capella Market City Club sponsor since 2014. And my question is, we've heard from uh, recently at City Club, I believe last spring, we heard from superintendents from two local school districts that observed that um, these incidents are, are gaining in schools at all levels. And um, certainly I've heard from high school uh, teachers that they've had an increase in incidents of hate speech within their schools. And I'm wondering, if any of your organizations or if any of you are speaking with local school districts about what they're seeing and how that's tying into your work. Jen Yaris Vanderhagen with the City of Eugene. Uh, yes, we partner closely with the school districts and in particular through the Equity and Community Consortium are able to work with 4J Springfield, 4J of Eugene and the Bethel School District. Uh, one thing that's a little bit tricky is bullying and harassment between students doesn't often rise to a level of a hate crime and so they have a very different system that they use to track what's going on and also to address those issues. So we coordinate but we don't often overlap in our efforts on those in those incidents because it's so sensitive that they deal with the students in a particular way. 
Um, we also, our office partners with uh, folks in the school districts across the community, specifically around increasing educational opportunities. So we are able to help and provide some support for curriculum. Okay, we have one last question. Thank you. Hi, Joan Obi, City Club member, and I'm just wondering, what are the consequences for perpetrators? Are there consequences? So if a, um, specifically for people who are committing hate and biased crimes, they are, the Eugene Police Department is absolutely investigating hate and biased crimes and pulling together information to share with uh, prosecution teams. Uh, I believe that the uh, levels at which they're prosecuted change if there's also a hate or bias marker added to it. Um, but I'm not an attorney, <laughs> so I'd uh, refer you to some other resources uh, around our community across the country to be able to better understand that. Mm -hmm. I know there was a, a man that came to the Eugene Center and threatened the lives of folks there, and he ended up spending uh, 70 days in jail and then was released with an ankle bracelet and a promise not to go back to that area. So that was the judgment. So for our group, we, you know, there are consequences, right? And the consequence is, is that we organize as a community. You know, right now these groups are worried about quote unquote Antifa, the people in the black mass. Our organizing model is, is that when you're having to deal with a whole community standing up and saying no, there's literally nowhere for you to hide. You, you, you can't get involved. Any, in any way in that community. Like our group, after the hate incident at the mosque, our group organized a group of people to go and sit watch on the mosque for the entire Ramadan. And there was not a single other incident. Like that's how it has to be done. The consequences are, if you don't want this in your community, you make it so that it can't be in your community. Great, thank you. Before we, <laughs> before, before we officially thank our guests today, there are a couple quick announcements. We want to thank KLCC 89.7, our public radio station, for airing our City Club programs on Mondays at 6.30 p.m. And this one will be on this coming Monday, 6.30 p.m. And also thank you to Community Television of Lane County for televising recent City Club programs. Next week's program, join us on October 6th on Friday, our program is Companion Animals and Service Animals, What's the Difference? With Erica Organ and Eugene Organ of Lane Independent Living Alliance. More details and information about future programs can be found online at City Club's website, cityclubofeugene.org. So we want to thank Jennifer Laris Vanderhagen, Ibrahim Hamid, Ruben Bundy and Nadia Telse, our speakers today. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes today's program.